The non-identity problem. This is chapter 16 of Reasons and Persons, um, Parfit's magnum opus. And it is uh, one of Parfit's perhaps most significant contributions to philosophy. Um, Jeff McMahon, who was a student of uh, Parfit's, a graduate student, and regards him as great, thinks that if he had to pick one contribution that Parfit made, he would say that it's pointing out this problem because it's, it's a, one of those things that's like an insight that you're amazed nobody had made up to that point. You know, there's, in philosophy, it's often said that basically we're rehashing Plato. Uh, uh, Alfred N Lord Whitehead, Alfred North Whitehead, described Western philosophy as footnotes to Plato. You know, everything since Plato was just haggling over the details. So it's very rare that genuinely new um, issues have uh, been discussed. But this appears to be one of them, the non-identity problem. So what is it? Well, it arises from the fact, first of all, uh, he, uh, he makes the point that most people accept, the vast majority of people accept, uh, which he calls the time dependence claim. If any particular person had not been conceived when they were in fact conceived, it is in fact true that that person would never have existed. What this means is that it is a necessary feature of anybody that they came from a particular sperm and egg. So that um, if those sperm and egg did not meet, you don't exist. You are, there are, when we talk about um, our own features, when we make counterfactual claims about ourselves, like I could have been president or something, most philosophers believe you can attach a truth value to those. And, and most people say, uh, there, yes, it's true. There is some possible world in which I am president. Uh, I, I feel for the people in that world. Um, but, what, so what that means is that me not being president is not an essential feature of me. Because in this other possible world, I am the same person. Uh, well, I don't want to get into that. Uh, there, uh, David Lewis says it would be my counterpart. but, but it is possible that I could, could have been president. So therefore, not, uh, me not being president is not an essential feature of me. I can be, still be me and be president. But I cannot still be me and uh, be born from a different sperm-egg combination. There is no other possible world in which I am me, but I was born from a different sperm and egg combination. So that's what the time de dependence claim is saying. It's a necessary feature of us that we are born of a particular uh, sperm and egg com combination. That means if uh, another, s if a different sperm, had, if you know, the split second when I was conceived, uh, a different sperm sort of had a last second fast spurt and got to the egg before the, the sperm uh, that in fact did, then it wouldn't have been me that was born. That other child, that child that was born was not me. So in other words, uh, what Puffett is saying is it you cannot say I could have been born um, two months earlier. In fact, you couldn't because if somebody was born two months earlier, it wouldn't have been you because it would have been a different sperm egg combination. Okay, with that in mind, um, he points out that decisions we make affect who exists. So, for example, merely the decision to delay conceiving for a month is a decision that affects, uh, that means that certain people that would have existed don't exist, and certain people that would not have existed if you'd conceived now do exist. So, you make decisions all the time that affect who exists. You make it the case that uh, certain people don't exist who would have existed, and certain people who would not have existed do exist. 
So, for example, in his case, the 14-year-old girl. Um, this girl chooses to have a child because she is so young, she gives her child a bad start in life. Though this will have bad effects throughout this child's life, his life will predictably be worth living. If this girl had waited for several years, she would have had a different child to whom she would have given a better start in life. Now, here's the essence of the non-identity problem. Um, when decisions we make affect who exist, it's very hard to say exactly how what we're doing is wrong in cases where we want to say it's wrong. So, for example, um, most people want to say it's wrong for this girl. You know, obviously, most 14 year old mothers, there's not much of her choice that goes into it. Um, you know, it's it's peer pressure or whatever, or, or you know, uh, non-consensual. But suppose this is a case of somebody, a 14-year-old, who genuinely makes the decision. Maybe it's in the future and she doesn't e even need to involve another person. She can just uh, buy sperm on the black market or something like that. And, well, for whatever reason, this person is in control and makes the choice to conceive. Most people would say that's wrong. But the non-identity problem is the problem of specifying in what way it's wrong. Because you cannot say that it is wrong because of its effect on the child that she actually has. And the reason why you can't say that is because if she had done otherwise, if she'd done the, the right thing and not conceived as a 14-year-old, that person wouldn't have existed. So, what we can say is, um, so long as that person's life is worth living, and here's the point, uh, most people, the vast majority of people would say, yeah, um, my life is worth living. In fact, we have an actual case that he talks about uh, on page 364, where a politician is, um, a politician, uh, a British politician is saying, we have too many teenage mothers. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to do something to prevent these children having children. And after the politician made that announcement, this middle-aged man wrote in to the paper and said, hang on a minute, you're saying that I shouldn't exist because I was conceived when my mother was 14 year olds and I think my life is worth living. I've had, you know, sure I've had some ups and downs, sure we had a hard start, it was, it was bad uh, that my mother was so young, but my life has been on pretty much, you know, mainly positive. Uh, and so what you're saying is that people like me shouldn't exist and I think that's wrong. So the non-identity problem is the problem of pointing to people who are harmed by policies that we want to say are wrong. So, the 14-year-old has a child. Can we point to the child and say, that child is harmed? No, we can't. Because that child's life is on the whole positive, and they wouldn't have existed if she'd done otherwise. So, you can't say that they would have been better off if she hadn't conceived, because they wouldn't have existed. Now, Parfit, throughout this chapter, doesn't get into the issue of whether bringing someone into existence is a benefit to them. Um, if you remember when we read that Jeff McMahon article uh, previously, he sort of skirts around this issue, um, which is, can you compare being alive to not existing? Uh, and and uh, someone like Ben Bradley wants to say that, seems to want to say that you can. So someone like Br Ben Bradley, I think, would say that it can benefit you to bring you into existence because we can say how much of a welfare level you have not existing and how much of a welfare level you have existing. And if the welfare level you have existing is, is higher than the welfare level you have not existing, then we can say that you coming into existence was a benefit to you. Now, what most people say is that 
Ben Bradley is crazy for saying you can have a welfare level by not existing. You, just, you can't make the comparison is the usual argument. So that's why all throughout this chapter Parfit says if coming into existence is a benefit to you then this, if it is not a benefit to you then this. He gives, he gives uh, both options all throughout um, because he doesn't want to take a stand on that issue. It's a, it's a complicated issue. But certainly we can't say that the 14-year-old old mother harms her child because the ch so long as the child has a life worth living, then you can't say that the child is harmed because the child uh, exists and uh, wouldn't exist otherwise. So the non-identity problem is the problem of specifying in what way it is um, wrong. Uh, to do some of these things. Okay, so it turns out that when we make choices, uh, sometimes they are, they will affect who exists. Not, not everything. I don't think, you know, my choice of whether to have pizza for lunch doesn't affect who will exist. But certainly, uh, you know, it's obvious in cases where you're talking about procreation, but it's also going to be the case when you make large-scale social decisions like whether or not to invest in fossil fuels or to go all out on renewable energy. Um, because depending on how you affect the standards of people's lives, they will decide whether or not to have children. So for example, right now people are getting all um, hand-ringy over the fact that younger generations are having fewer children and later children. Uh, so for example, you know, Gen, Gen Z and, and millennials, well, Gen Z, might, most of them may be a bit young anyway, but uh, certainly millennials have had fewer children, I think, on the whole um, than uh, earlier generations. And that's because of the economic climate and because of, you know, the way of the world. Uh, it's because of the circumstances they're in, and the circumstances they're in are as a result of social policies of previous generations. This is why millennials and Gen Zs hate boomers, because they have screwed up the planet and, and you know, they've sucked up all the resources, and now, you know, so boomers tell, gen, tell, tell millennials, you know, when I was your age, I'd was living on my own and I had my own job and, and you know, everything. And, and then in response, millennials point out, well, you know, going to college cost a couple of hundred dollars. You could easily do that and get your own apartment. Whereas now apartment rents are through the roof. Uh, college tuition is through the roof. You know, I cannot afford to do the things you took for granted because of, you know, the, the, the world that you've left for us. So, social policies will have an effect on who exists. You can, uh, now, I don't think we can know whether we're making, which of these kind of choices we're making, but you can distinguish between uh, same people choices, that is choices where the same people will exist, but maybe in one situation they'll be better off and in another situation they'll be worse off. Um, those kinds of choices we know how to decide which one is right and which one is wrong. Because obviously when you're talking about should we have these people with this welfare level or should we have the same people with a higher welfare level, it seems clear we should, uh, we should take the second choice because you've got the same people only in one situation, they're better off. Easy choice to make. You don't face the non-identity problem there. But then these two options are where you have different people existing. Uh, same number but different people choices, and then you have different, number, uh, different people and uh, a different number. These are the kind of options um, you, uh, you face um, when you're making large-scale social policies. Okay, now, what Parfit does not do in this chapter is solve this problem. What he does is specify that there is a problem, uh, and again, the problem is um, that we think that uh, 
the, the problem is that he's come up with examples where we think something wrong is being done, like the 14-year-old having a child. But we cannot find a way of explaining why it is wrong. Um, now, if you're not... Oh, um, uh, this is a book. You won't be able to see this because it'll be mirror image, but it's by David Boonin. And he wrote a whole book about the non-identity problem. And it's, uh, it's a very nicely, clearly written book. Um, and he introduces it this way. Uh, he is reminded, because this is obviously a, a case that Parfit made up. But um, he's, I'll, I'll read you the preface. In early March 2013, the city of New York began putting up a series of public service announcements aimed at discouraging teenage pregnancy. In one particularly poignant example, a sweet little boy with a mournful expression and tears gently trickling down his face uh, gazes directly at the viewer while the accompanying text reads, I'm twice as likely not to graduate high school because you had me as a teen. The campaign sparked a bit of controversy over whether it inappropriately stigmatized teenage parents and their children. But lost in all the noise was the fact that the ad also quietly concealed a disturbing moral paradox. Um, and that is, it's not true that the boy is worse off because if his mother had not had him as a teenager, he literally wouldn't have existed. And if he could choose between, if he, you know, if he's a soul in heaven making a choice, either I exist and I have this life that's suboptimal where I'm crying because, you know, I'm less likely to graduate high school or not exist at all, then obviously he's going to prefer the, ex the case where he exists. So really, he's better off. Now, uh, what Parfit says, if coming into existence benefits you, then he is literally better off. If coming to an existence doesn't benefit you because we can't make the comparison between not existing and existing, we can at least say he's not worse off. He's certainly not worse off than he would have been because in the alternative situation where the, the, the mother didn't have a child, he literally wouldn't exist. So this whole, um, this whole advertising campaign is based on kind of a lie because it's making it seem like this kid is worse off than he would have been. No, he's not worse off than he would have been. All right. Now, that's the case of um, uh, the young girl's child, uh, a young girl's child. Um, the objection to this girl's decision is that it would probably be worse for, for her child. If she waited, she would probably have given him a better start in life. If you mean by that child, uh, the particular child that he, she has, this, this claim which, um, uh, which Parfit labels A, is literally false. It is not true that... Um, she could have given that child a better start in life by waiting because that child would not have existed. You could try to make this claim true, he says, by, by meaning by his child whichever child she has. So yes, it is certainly true that if she waited, she would have had a child who would be better off than the child that she actually had. But the trouble is, it's a different child. So not having this child will be better for that child. But what's that to the child she doesn't have? She, the child she doesn't have is not going to see that as a win because they don't get to exist. So what is the principle? If we want to say that what she did was wrong, what principle can we refer to? And Parfit suggests Q on page 360, the same number quality claim. If in either of two possible outcomes, the same number of people would ever live, in this case it's just one, um, you know, either I have this kid now or I have a different kid later, but in the same cases, we just have one person existing. If in either of two possible outcomes, the same number of people would ever live, it would be worse if those who live are worse off or have a lower quality of life than those who would have lived. Uh, if that claim is true, then that enables us to explain why... Um, the 14, why the 14 year old mother did something wrong. But the trouble with this principle is it appears 
to violate another principle that we um, uh, that we hold to, which is the person affecting view. And the person affecting view is that if something is wrong, it is wrong for particular people. This is um, on page, this is in uh, section 125. Uh, it will be worse if people are affected for the worse. That is, what it is for um, something to be wrong is if it makes people worse off. And of course, what the non-identity problem set shows is that this doesn't make people worse off. Furthermore, and perhaps more worryingly, because this is just one individual, uh, you can apply this on a so society level um, uh, scale. So for example, suppose uh, we want to go all in on fossil fuels and we decide to invest a as we have gone all in on fos fossil fuels. We will adopt one of the two depletion choices here. So this, uh, the pink and the green line, this is lesser depletion, this is greater depletion. By going all in on fossil fuels now, uh, or, or back you know, when we started doing it, because there were no real alternatives, or, well, we would have had to, we would have had to not uh, have such a vast source of energy. We would have had to progress at a slower rate if we hadn't uh, gone all in on fossil fuels. So the result of going all in on fossil fuels is that we get a burst of um, well-being for the people over the 200 years, you know, the fossil fuel age, we, uh, we do better than if we hadn't, than if we hadn't, you know, we'd been, lived more sustainably. Now, if we had lived more sustainably, we wouldn't have destroyed the environment. We wouldn't have global warming, that kind of thing. So after a certain point, when the early sugar rush of fossil fuels wears off, we're better off. So it looks like most people would say conservation is the morally correct um, path. Certainly more than uh, what we actually did, where you know, we're going to get, we're already getting catastrophic results of global warming, uh, and you know, many, many people will suffer as a result of what we did. So this is the path we're on. This would have been a better path, we want to say. Conservations, conservationists say, it's clear we should have done this. But the non-identity problem says, that seems right, but ha can you point to people who are worse off? And you literally cannot point to people who are worse off, because the people who exist here are not the same people as the people who exist here. You can't say, well, this person is clearly worse off because he, he or she would have been better off up here. But it wouldn't be him or her, because this is going to be a different number choice. Different, because of uh, the different way we live, you know, more people are having more children earlier because they're feeling, because of a higher standard of living, you tend to have this. So this is like the boomers, and this is like the millennials. The millennials have fewer children um, and wait longer to have them. So these aren't going to be the same people. You can't say uh, clearly greater depletion is bad because it's so much worse off for people. The only way you can say that, and Puffett wants to be able to say this, is if we don't care that it's a different person. If we say that we should have the best possible person, then clearly we can say that conservation is the morally correct choice. But if we are committed to the idea that um, uh, Per, uh, uh, this idea that we could only say a policy is wrong if it makes particular people worse off, then we cannot say that depletion is worse than conservation. And he gives another example like this. He says, if you don't, if this doesn't do it for you, well, consider the risky policy, because the risky policy is where we bury nuclear waste in a place that it will be safe from. Uh, earthquakes for about 200 years, 
but then after about 200 years, earthquakes will start and it will release all our nuclear waste and it will cause cancer and kill thousands of people. Uh, clearly, we, he would say that's wrong. But given that the, the risky policy produces, we, we embark on this risky policy because it's cheaper and we save money on our energy policy and we save money on our disposal so we can spend it on you know, nice libraries or swim, public swimming pools and people. Um, it will obviously affect uh, the reproductive choices of people over that time. So the people who end up dying of cancer when the earthquakes make the nuclear waste um, uh, leak out, they would not have existed if not for the risky policy. And, you know, sure, they die horribly by inches in their 40s, let's say, but the, the majority of them are glad of the 40 years that they got. Um, for, I mean, this, if you think that uh, the non-identity problem seems a bit dry and sterile of a, of a philosophical issue, Boonin also has a good point to make. He says, um, there are all kinds of implications uh, in actual choices that we're making. So, for example, he says, uh, a recent study of in vitro fertilization um, reports that 3% of the clinics that perform the procedure have al allowed prospective parents to use genetic screening to select in favor of deliberately implanting embryos with, with a selected for disability, with deafness in cases of deaf parents apparently being the most common example. So, in other words, IVF clinics are allowing prospective parents to ensure that the child that they have will be deaf uh, because they're deaf parents and they want their child to be like them. A lot of people are outraged by this. They say, um, you can't do that. You can't purposely bring into existence a deaf child. That's, you're, that's terribly immoral for the child. But, of course, the non-identity problem points out, no, it isn't because this is an obvious case where if they don't select for a deaf child, they're picking a different embryo, a non-deaf embryo, so the, the deaf one won't exist as a person, will never get to live a life. You cannot say that it is worse for a person uh, to, be to have a life as a deaf person than not to exist. That's ridiculous. Um, deaf people live perfectly happy lives. So the non-identity problem uh, applies in bioethics right now. You know, what is your criticism of allowing people to implant embryos that are disabled? Now, of course, many people don't want to criticize um, people for having deaf children. Uh, but, you know, what kind, of, what kind of selection would you object to? Maybe there's some case where um, you know, deaf-blind. Suppose you pick someone who's deaf-blind. Unless that person can literally say that they would have been better off not existing, at no point can you say that this policy harms them. It doesn't harm them. They have uh, a life that uh, is better than not existing. So the non-identity problem has real-world implications. Now, one response you can make to the non-identity problem is to say, to kind of embrace it and say, well, this is great news. This means we can indulge in depletion. We can have, we can have our cake without it having a bad effect. All these, you know, fear mongers are telling us we'll make life worse off for future generations. Uh, and sure, future generations, the people who live in future generations will be worse off than the people that would have lived if we'd conserved. But we do not make things worse for the people that uh, we end up causing to exist. In fact, they will say, we're the people in the future will say, we're glad that you made that choice because we exist and we wouldn't have existed. We owe our lives to you, these people would say to, uh, to us for investing in, in fossil fuels. So, you know, uh, 
the big oil executives can, could say to environmentalists, hold on, I've got this uh, future phone. I'm going to get the people in the future on the phone. Are you glad that we did this? Are, are you happy that you exist? Would you rather not exist? No? Okay, well then you're glad you took, we, we're doing this. So, uh, and in fact, if it's true that you can benefit people by causing them to exist, we not only don't harm them, we benefit those people by our policy. So, nerds to you environmentalists, we're not doing anything wrong. That would be to embrace uh, the implications of the non-identity problem. And in fact, something like that, although I doubt uh, he would, you know, side with fossil fuels executives, is uh, the approach that Boonin takes. However, Parfit does not take that claim. Parfit wants to say there is something wrong with uh, adopting the risky policy, with uh, depletion, with having a child too early. But he realizes that in order to specify what that is, he needs a theory. And he says, we've got this policy, the same number quality claim, that we can apply to simple cases where it's just one, say, one person exists now or one person exists later, but uh, it's the same number choices. We've got a simple, uh, a plausible sounding principle that we can apply on those, but that doesn't work for different number choices. That won't help with cases like this. So what we need is something that subsumes this, um, that uh, will handle these bigger cases, these different number choices. And he says, I'm going to call that theory X, and the rest of my book will be a pursuit of a theory that will explain what's wrong with this, that will solve the non-identity problem. Um, now, what would he say to people who say, why bother? Don't, don't bother doing that. It, I, it's true. You don't harm, you don't make anybody worse off. And in fact, you benefit some people, uh, even in, if you adopt depletion. Um, he, so he, uh, to respond to those people, he says, does the fact of non-identity make a moral difference? And here we've got the medical program, it's MME because it's English in, uh, in his version. The medical program, and he says, we have a choice. Uh, uh, condition J, we have either of these, we have both of these conditions. Condition J is a condition where if a pregnant woman has it, it will cause her child to have a certain handicap. Um, so notice that what you're doing there is you're uh, affecting same people because um, if you stop the pregnant women from having this, you stop an actually ex existing fetus from getting a condition. So you're benefiting actual, already existing individuals uh, if you get rid of J. So this we can make sense of with the person affecting view. We can say, yes, we want to combat condition J because we make uh, already existing people not have a handicap, so they're better off. Compare that with condition K. If you have it when you conceive, it causes your child to have the same handicap. But if you wait two months, it goes away. So if we come back condition K, what it will mean uh, is that different people uh, exist who don't have the handicap. So in condition K, we have a choice of one person existing and having the handicap or a different person existing and not having the handicap. Whereas in condition J, we've got one, one person having the handicap or the same person not having the handicap. This view, our sort of uh, knee-jerk view that for something to be wrong, it has to have an effect on actual people, says that we should absolutely get rid of condition J and we should spend our money on J because then we're saving, we're stopping a per, an actual person from being worse off than we, and we shouldn't fight condition K because that will be better for no one. Uh, you're choosing between one person existing with a handicap whose life would have been worth living or a different person existing without the handicap. So he wants to say that it doesn't matter. It makes no moral difference whether we fight J or K. He says, I judge the two programs, this is programs of fighting J or fighting K, 
um, to be equally worthwhile by reasoning as follows. Whichever program is cancelled, because uh, in, the, in the thought experiment you can't pay for both of them. You have to choose a program to fight this or a program to fight this. If you subscribe to this view, you will choose to fight J <coughs> and you will not choose to fight K, whereas he says it makes no difference. Uh, whichever program is cancelled, there will later be just as many people with the handicap. This matches my reaction to our choice of depletion, he says on page 369. I believe that it would be bad if there would later be a great lowering of the quality of life. Uh, and I believe that it would not be worse if the people who later live would themselves have existed if we'd chosen conservation. The bad effect would not be worse if it had been in this way worse for any particular people. And considering both cases, I accept the no difference view. So the no difference view says there's no difference um, in these two policies, whereas the person affecting view says there is a difference uh, because J uh, is a case where you can affect already existing people, whereas K is a case where you're choosing between different people existing. So he does not think that um, we can discard, we can just say, uh, this is not a problem. Well, I accept the implications. Um, Boonin puts it nicely. He, in his um, opening chapter, he, uh, he calls his opening chapter five plausible premises and an implausible conclusion. And uh, the five plausible premises are, uh, he describes uh, a case very much like this, only with Flintstones inspired names. So premise one, Wilma's act of conceiving now, rather than taking a pill once a day for two months before conceiving, this is, it, it's actually more like this case, where she has, um, uh, she has a condition where if she uh, takes the pill, it will ensure that her child doesn't have the condition but she has to wait two months, so therefore it's a different child. Wilma's act of conceiving now rather than taking a pill once a day for two months before conceiving does not make Pebbles worse off. Pebbles is the child that she has. If she doesn't wait, who will have a handicap, Rox is the child that she will have later if she takes the pill and waits for two months. And um, uh, so you, she has a choice between Pebbles with a handicap or Rox without a handicap. Wilma's act of conceiving now rather than taking a pill uh, once a day for two months before conceiving does not make Pebbles worse off than she would otherwise have been. Premise two, if A's act harms B, then A's act makes B worse off than B would otherwise have been. Wilma's act of conceiving now rather than taking a pill once a day for two months before conceiving does not harm anyone other than Pebbles, obviously. Uh, if an act does not harm anyone, then the act does not wrong anyone. If an act does not wrong anyone, then the act is not morally wrong. Wilma's act of conceiving pebbles is not morally wrong. Why? Because it doesn't harm pebbles, because pebbles is not better off, is not worse off than she would have been, because if, she, if Wilma had taken the pills, pebbles wouldn't exist. So it doesn't harm pebbles, it doesn't harm anybody else. Therefore, it doesn't wrong anyone, and if it doesn't wrong anyone, it isn't wrong. So conclusion, Wilma's act of conceiving pebbles is not morally wrong. That's the non-identity problem. Uh, and in this, um, he considered, he has a chapter on each of the premises, because uh, people have written on this policy, uh, this uh, problem a lot since Parfit discussed it. And he looks at all of the possible ways to undermine the premises in, in an attempt to avoid the conclusion. And he ends up, nope, you've got to accept all the promises, premises, so therefore you have to accept the conclusion. Parfit doesn't want to do that. He thinks that that's ridiculous. And in fact, he says, uh, if, we're, if we're committed to the person affecting view, he says, uh, this is just an incomplete view. It, may, it only makes sense when you're talking about same people choices. That's why people uh, have committed to the person affecting view that something is only wrong if it affects people. Um, because we focused on, on same people choices. 
Uh, but once we realize that there are these other options, we will see that the person affecting view is narrow, is too narrow and can't be the whole truth, as he says on page 370. V draws a moral distinction where on our view no distinction should be drawn. It's the distinction between these two policies. Because uh, remember, V says this one is bad, this one is not bad. This one is bad because it, it actually affects people. You're choosing between a person existing without a disability and the same person existing with that disability. Uh, whereas this uh, is choosing between a person existing with a disability and a different person existing without a disability. The person of acting view says we should prejudice J. And he says, V draws a moral distinction where on our view no distinction should be drawn. V is like the claim that it is wrong to enslave whites, which is true. It is wrong to enslave whites, but that's because it's wrong to enslave anybody. So in other words, it's only a part of the the truth. The whole truth must be theory X. It's wrong to enslave whites or to deny the vote to adult males. Yes, it's wrong to deny the vote to adult males, but that's only part of the truth. It's wrong to deny the vote to anybody. Um, and that's what he says is wrong with this, and that's why we've got to get rid of that. Uh, but turns out what we will discover is that theory, finding theory X is very difficult because the candidates that we try have themselves very weird implications, and that's when we get into the repugnant conclusion and stuff like that, which is coming up later. There you go.